you all so much for coming here tonight. I know you've all probably worked a long day, and, and now uh, here we are. But hopefully, this will be of value to you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, both the Association of Healthcare Journalists for partnering with us on this event, and also the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for uh, making this event possible. So, we are here to talk about uh, the subject of narrow networks. Um, this is a phenomenon that came about with the Affordable Care Act. It is not, um, uh, it is not just happening with exchange health <coughs> plans. We know that this is a phenomenon that's really uh, taken, taken root. Um, with the Affordable Care Act and health plans no longer being able to um, uh, work to lower their costs by um, with pre-existing condition limitations or uh, denials. Uh, the ACA also um, uh, made it impossible for health plans to uh, put restrictions on lifetime limits and, and other things, mm -hmm. other tools that the health plans were using to try and keep their costs down. So with that, a lot of the health plans very quickly uh, in the first year turned to uh, narrow networks. They decided to um, uh, to cut out, a lot of them decided to cut out some of the most expensive uh, providers with hospitals and, and physicians and other providers in their systems, in their uh, networks. Um, so while some folks have expressed concern about access, uh, others uh, have said, and many people have said, if done the right way, this could create competition and uh, keep costs down. Uh, which would be a good thing for consumers. So there's a lot of discussion about this, especially now that we've been through this a year, and of course we're right in the middle of the second open enrollment period. So uh, we have with us today uh, four amazing speakers, and you have full bios in your packets. So I'm, I'm really just gonna give the, uh, the quick version of, of who they are. Uh, to my left is Larry Levitt. He's Senior Vice President for Special Inis Initiatives at the Kaiser Family Foundation um, and Senior Advisor to the President of the Foundation. Um, to his left is uh, Betsy Impulse. She is Special Projects Director of Consumers Union. And next to her is uh, Ann Price. And Ann is the Director of the Plan Management Division at Covered California. And way down there on the end is um, Emily, is it Bazar? Is that her pronunciation? Yeah. She is a columnist and a senior writer for the California Healthcare Foundation Center for Health Reporting. Um, she uh, writes the Ask Emily column where everyone is bombarding her with questions about the Affordable Care Act and, and other health care policy issues. Uh, before we get started with Larry, I just want to, just a couple of quick housekeeping matters. I just want to let you know what you may or may not have picked up on your way in. There's a folder that has uh, in it a couple of things. Uh, one, it has your bios and such. There's also a blue sheet, which is an evaluation. We would really be grateful if you could fill that out before the evening is through. Uh, we'd love to do these sessions with the HCJ and we'd love to know what you'd like to hear or what you'd like us to be doing. Um, on the other side is uh, a compilation of some materials, uh, both um, newspaper articles and also uh, reports on this subject. Um, now, there's a little card inside the folder and that just shows you a couple of ways in which the Alliance for Health Reform can assist reporters. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We work out of uh, Washington, D.C. We have uh, two. Um, we have two senators who are uh, our honorary chairman, uh, Senator Rockefeller, who is our founding honorary chairman, of course, just retired. So Senator Ben Cardin, Democrat from Mar Maryland, took over, and also Senator Roy Blunt, Republican from Missouri. Um, they keep us honest and, and nonpartisan in everything that we do. So on this uh, card, you have, it tells you how to use our Find an Expert Service for Reporters, which is a database <coughs> of uh, more than 500 experts in the healthcare policy world. Um, you can search it, you can call me, and I can help you find folks, but it's really very extensive. If you need a Spanish speaker in a certain city, we actually might be able to find it. 
Um, okay, on the other side, it talks about the source book, covering health issues, and that's this book. This book is about a year old, but on the back of it, it, it gives you a list of all the uh, issues, all the chapters that are in the book. Each chapter, say you want to look at health care costs, it is a background on um, uh, where we have been on health care costs uh, and what the current trends are, what the data is, uh, and also some just a little bit of discussion about where we're going. Also, at the end of each chapter, there is a, a list of experts along with phone numbers and uh, email addresses. Um, we also keep that uh, up to date online. So, uh, again, here this will tell you how to find it. If all of a sudden you find you have to cover something on Medicare and you usually do Medicaid, this is something that might be of some help. So, I am first going to turn the microphone over to Larry who's going to give us a pretty uh, broad overview of where we are on this subject. <clears throat> Thanks. Broad as in seven minutes. So, <laughs> um, Well, I'm actually going to start by disagreeing with Marilyn. <laughs> uh, not about the Alliance for Health Reform, okay. which is a terrific resource, um, but about the idea that, that uh, narrow networks originated with the Affordable Care Act. Um, in fact, narrow networks or limited networks um, very much predated the Affordable Care Act. And selective contracting by insurers has always been their primary tool for controlling costs. Um, in fact, in California, Kaiser Permanente is you know, kind of the definition of a, of a, narrow, a narrow network in some ways. Um, but historically, while, while networks have been limited, um, they've generally been quite broad, including lar large numbers of, of doctors and hospitals. Um, and there have been attempts over, over time for, uh, by some insurers, actually in California, um, to create narrower networks for, uh, for employers who, of course, uh, provide most of the health insurance uh, in the United States. Um, but those have generally been met by cold shoulders on the part of, of employers. Um, I mean, the whole reason employers <coughs> offer health benefits to their workers is to attract a quality workforce. Um, so the idea that you're going to take doctors and hospitals away uh, from your workers uh, and piss them off in the process uh, turns out to be not, not so attractive. Um, it's very hard, particularly if you're an employer or a large employer, it's very hard to satisfy the bulk of your workforce with a, with a narrow network plan. Um, but even, even broad networks pose some, have, have posed some tough decisions for employers. I sat in on some focus groups recently with uh, human resources managers for small and, and mid-sized companies. Um, and they all said that when choosing a plan or, or deciding whether to, to switch insurers, the first thing they do is they collect a list of all the doctors that their senior executives use, and they match that up with the uh, networks of all the insurers, and that's, that's how they pick an insurer. Um, so the ACA didn't create limited networks, but it has, uh, I would agree with Marilyn, that it has accelerated the trend towards narrower networks, and that's particularly true in, in, Cal in California, um, and particularly true in the individual insurance market or in the new marketplaces like Covered in California. Um, as Marilyn mentioned, you know, one of the ways in the individual market that <coughs> used to uh, keep costs and premiums down was by excluding people with pre-existing conditions. That's no longer an option, so they needed to look uh, to, to other ways of doing that, and narrow networks have been, um, have been one, of those, one of those ways. Um, insurers also went into this market um, expecting consumers to be very price conscious. Um, and again, these are consumers buying their own insurance often paying either the whole premium or uh, paying the full difference in premiums between a low-cost plan and a high-cost plan, even if they're getting help in the, in the new ACA marketplaces. Um, and it turns out people have actually been very price conscious, um, looking primarily at the premium when choosing their plan. Um, the data show that, that people have gravitated towards one of the two lowest-cost plans uh, in the exchanges, usually in the silver or, or second tier. Um, and insurers been able, have been able to attract big market share by lowering their premium through through narrow networks, um, and some of our polling uh, supports that. We asked people whether uh, we asked uninsured people and also people with employer coverage, would you uh, prefer a plan with a lower premium and a narrow network, or would you be pay willing to pay more for a broader network? And the uninsured, in particular, majority of them said they would prefer a uh, a, a lower premium plan uh, with a narrower network. Um, and these plans are definitely lower premiums. Uh, there's not good analysis of this, but McKinsey uh, had one analysis which found that narrower network plans offered by the same insurer and the same type of plan had a 26% premium advantage 
of a plan that covered a, a broader set of, of hospitals. They looked particularly at hospitals. And then just for a moment, I just want to mention that you have that report in your folder. Uh, and I think my conversations with insurers suggest that that's probably a little bit overstated. Um, you know, I would look, I would think narrow network plans generally have a price advantage somewhere between 10 and 20 percent, but there is a significant price advantage. And as I said, people have been very price conscious in, in choosing which plans they enroll in. Um, so this all raises uh, a couple different issues. First is whether these plans are so narrow that they're inadequate, um, at least in a, a legal sense, in effect failing to deliver the benefits that they promised to deliver to consumers. Um, second is even if the, they meet minimum standards of, of adequacy, um, how can consumers navigate the system and choose plans effectively uh, with the proliferation of, of narrow network plans? Um, so let me start briefly with the issue of, of adequacy. Um, there's not a lot of evidence at this point, I would say, um, others may, uh, Betsy may disagree, uh, that these narrow network plans are so narrow that they're, they're actually inadequate, at least in a legal sense. Um, but it's, we're somewhat challenged here by the fact that the regulation in this area can be quite loose um, and depends not only on the type of state, on the, on the state, but also the, the type of plan. Um, if we sort of start at the top level, uh, the, the statute, the Affordable Care Act, um, doesn't provide a lot of detail here. There's essentially two requirements in the Affordable Care Act. One is that marketplace plans have to ensure sufficient choice, um, a fairly loose standard, um, and they have to include uh, what are called essential community providers, <coughs> providers that serve lower income patients. Um, once, uh, once the law was implemented through regulations, not a whole lot of detail was actually added here. The final regulation from, from HHS um, said that plans had to provide benefits without unreasonable delays. Um, again, fairly, fairly, a fairly loose standard. Um, and also make provider directories available publicly. Um, in the first year, the way HHS has, has uh, implemented this uh, is they, in the first year, in 2014, they relied on accreditation bodies, in particular uh, two organizations, NCQA and URAC, um, to accredit plans. So if a plan was accredited by those, by those bodies, then they were presumed to have an adequate network. Um, and those bodies generally did not require that insurers had specific, uh, or did not require specific standards or do an independent review of the networks, but instead required that insurers have their own policies or have their, their own standards. Um, for this year and for, for next year, HHS has said they will apply, is applying a re, what, what's known as a reasonable access standard. So they're looking at plans, if they have any reason to believe that the plans are not providing reasonable access uh, to providers, then they do further investigation, uh, but again, without a lot of detail of, of what that actually means. Um, so, so far, a lot of this has been left up to the states, who have historically been quite uneven in how strictly they, they police networks. Uh, first, as I mentioned, different plans tend to have different standards. Um, plans uh, with uh, um, uh, HMOs are more likely to um, be subject to, to rules around network adequacy than uh, more loosely organized uh, PPOs. <coughs> um, some states, California being one of them, Texas being another, um, have specific standards uh, for, for, for two factors. One is the ratio of the number of providers to the number of enrollees. So you've got to have enough providers to serve the number of enrollees you're signing up. Um, and uh, also what's known as time and distance standards. So essentially looking at how accessible providers are based on where they are um, to consumers in the plans service area. Um, the federal government has similar standards for, for Medicare plans. And as said, they'll consider these numeric standards in the future for marketplace plans, but again, have not, have not gotten there yet. Um, and other states have chosen um, to have uh, more flexible standards, you know, not a strict standard for a provider to enrollee ratio or time and distance, uh, but a more flexible standard that they, they apply to, to plans. Um, the other regulatory action in this area has been through the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, um, which has a model law. And NEIC has model laws on lots of different things, a requirement that states um, actually put in, put in place those laws, but they have to be sort of guides uh, for uh, for states. Um, in this case, uh, very few states have actually taken up the model law. About 10 states um, have, have actually put. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand what this word is. There's the mo model. Oh, model. Model. Model sorry. law. Okay. Okay. <laughs> model law. Model law. Model law. That would not make a lot of sense. A model law. A model law. Um, about 10 states have put in place uh, either all or part of the model law. Model. Uh, and another 10 have, have done something uh, s similar. 
Um, and, uh, and the law leaves a lot of details up to states, even if they put in place, um, put in place the model. Um, the other approach that, that's, uh, that's been considered is, is sort of uh, providing a, something with safety valve for patients. Um, because it is you know, very hard to police or determine the adequacy of these networks up front. An approach is to essentially, after the fact, to provide consumers with the safety valve if they run into trouble. Um, so for example, um, the federal government has this, but only for preventive benefits. Uh, in the ACA, plans have to provide preventive benefits with no patient cost sharing. Um, and the regulations say that if you're not, you're not able to find a provider for those preventive benefits, let's say for a colonoscopy um, or a mammogram, that you can go out of network um, and get those benefits. The plan has to provide you those benefits <coughs> still for no cost sharing. Uh, but that does not apply for anything beyond preventive benefits. So it's, it's just, uh, just, just preventive benefits. Um, but similar provisions do exist in states for benefits beyond preventive care. For example, the California Department of Insurance, um, and I should probably just briefly stop for those of you who aren't familiar, there are two regulatory bodies in California, the Department of Insurance and the Department of Managed Health Care. Uh, the Department of Insurance is run by an elected insurance commissioner. The Department of Managed Health Care is run by a, an appointee of, of the governor. Um, the vast majority of health insurance plans are regulated by the Department of Managed Health Care. Um, though there are a few cases where they are regulated by the Department of, of Insurance. But a, a, certainly HMOs um, and most HMO-like plans are regulated by the Department of Managed Healthcare. Um, well, the Insurance Commissioner recently issued emergency regulations um, to provide this kind of safety valve um, for, for all types of plans that are under, under his control. And I believe, that's issue correct, but I believe a similar provision exists uh, for, for HMOs as well in California. Um, you know, a similar issue can arise when a patient is using their plan uh, when they're seeking care at an in-network facility, in particular a hospital, uh, where they may, uh, the patient may uh, you know, do, do her diligence and, and go to an in-network hospital, uh, but end up getting treated at that hospital by out-of-network providers. Uh, it might be a surgeon, it might be an anesthesiologist, a radiologist, that might be a lab that's, that's reading her, um, her, her lab results. Um, and she often has no way of knowing uh, this is going to happen once she's chosen the, the in-network hospital. Um, again, these new regulations issued by the Department of Insurance um, start to get at this a little bit by uh, requiring network facilities, so network hospitals, to inform a patient ahead of time if any out-of-network providers will be caring for, for her while she's, while she's getting care. No requirement that they be in-network, but at least informing the patient that they, um, that they might be. Um, so this starts to get beyond the question of just regulation, but how consumers actually actually navigate this system. And this gets to the issue of transparency, how well consumers actually know when they're choosing a plan or even using a plan, um, what the network looks like. Um, as I mentioned, public uh, provider directories are now publicly available. Uh, plans are required to provide them. Um, but there continue to be questions about how accurate these directories are. Um, and depending on the state, they're updated at different, uh, different intervals throughout the year. Um, and, um, and so how up to date and how accurate they are to, to begin with. Um, and not all of this is within the control of insurers. I mean, providers may stop taking patients or may drop out of a network, um, and the insurer has to, has to keep up with that. Um, the directories are also not always easy to use. Um, they vary, they vary, they're within the control of the insurers, so they vary from insurer to insurer. Um, typically, what you have to do when you go to one of these directories is you can search for a particular doctor or a particular hospital, and it'll tell you whether that doctor or hospital is in the, is in the insurer's network. Um, but if you're choosing a plan, you may have multiple doctors that your family is using, you've got to do this for every doctor and for every plan uh, you might be considering. Um, the LA Times had a kind of interesting uh, solution to this. They've got a data journalism project where they, through a Public Records Act, uh, request got the provider directories and created an interactive uh, map-based app where you can actually look geographically which providers are in your area and then see which, which plans they're in. But that's, that's not, certainly not something that, ex that exists everywhere and there's no guarantee that app will be, um, will be up, up to date. Um, it's also a fundamental challenge here for, for patients um, in that you, know, you, may know, uh, you may know who your primary care providers are, who your family members, primary care providers are, if you have a chronic illness and you're seeing a specialist regularly, uh, you may have a relationship with that specialist. Um, but 
but it's just the nature of healthcare that you don't always know what's going to happen to you. Um, so you may be healthy now when you're picking a plan, but you don't know that six months from now you're going to be diagnosed with diabetes or, or heart condition, and all of a sudden you're going to need, uh, need a specialist. So when you're choosing the plan, you have no way of knowing that you need to look for a cardiologist and which cardiologist is in your network because you didn't know you needed a cardiologist at the time. Um, so in some sense, what you would ideally want is some kind of rating system that tells you whether an insurer is a broad network or a narrow network. So at least you have a sense of what you're choosing when you're making that trade-off between the premium and the network. And that may not be obvious to you if you're just searching for your, your family's uh, primary care providers. Um, so in, in closing, I think it's fair to say that these narrow networks are here to stay. Uh, if you talk to insurers, they, they certainly feel like they made the right the right marketing decision by narrowing networks and, and lowering premiums uh, in the first couple of years. Uh, there may be a backlash at some point, uh, but as of now, many people buying coverage seem to be willing to, to have these narrow networks in, in return for, for lower premiums. Um, and we may actually even be seeing this um, expanding to the employer market as well. Uh, Lisa's written about the, uh, the fight, current fight going on between Blue Shield, uh, et cetera, uh, which could affect a significant number of patients uh, with, with employer-based coverage. Um, and it remains to be seen, this fight may, may be all about brinkmanship and they'll, they'll reach a deal soon, but it's at least an indication that Blue Shield, a uh, major insurer in the state, is, is willing to start uh, dipping a toe into the water with uh, narrow networks for employer-based um, uh, employer benefits as well as the individual market. Great, thank you, Larry. So we're going to move now to Betsy, if you could pass yep. our microphone down, that would be great. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so there's no question that it's an extremely dynamic point in history in the healthcare marketplace. Um, and the network issue has certainly garnered a lot of attention. Um, I do agree with Larry that this is, it coincides with the ACA and maybe accelerated by it, that is the narrow network issue. Um, but it was happening, starting to happen anyway, it was going to happen because we've all come to recognize, I think, that healthcare costs are sort of spiraling out of control and we do need to find ways to rein them in. And of course, the narrow networks are one technique that's put forward to assume that um, health plans can negotiate hard with providers, guarantee the providers a volume of care, therefore costs will go down to the plans and hopefully be passed on to the consumer um, and everything will then uh, be stabilized. That's the theory. And you know, I do think that it's early on, um, that the evidence isn't fully in yet. I think we need more time really to figure it out. Um, but it does seem to have lowered premiums somewhat and we just, you know, that gets us then very quickly to the question of network adequacy. And just for the record, Consumers Union, um, with the published consumer reports, um, doesn't oppose narrower networks so long as they are sufficient in terms of the network adequacy standards in the state. Um, and th that the savings are attained and are actually passed along to consumers, that the quality of the, um, of the providers is, um, is good quality. Um, and those are, all, those are all this, and I think we're waiting to see um, what happens out there in the marketplace. Also, I think we need to be able to signal to consumers what they're getting. Um, <coughs> this is a very broad network, a narrower network, an ultra-narrow network, and I think that's another sort of evolving policy thing that we need to work on more and test with consumers to to see how we develop those kinds of measures. So as Larry said, network adequacy really is a term of art. It's a legal um, regulatory standard that only the regulators can enforce, and it involves these things like you know, time and distance standards, <coughs> how quickly we get an appointment, in some cases provider ratios. Um, but only the regulators, the Department of Managed Health Care and the Department of Insurance in California can enforce those. I would also add in a third agency, just to make things really complicated, which is the Department of Healthcare Services, which has a role in ensuring the adequacy of Medi-Cal plan networks. So add that additional state layer onto that. But we also have, as Larry was describing, um, other players now increasingly involved and concerned about networks. Um, and you know, I think that's partly because it's not just network adequacy, the legal standard that, that counts, but also for consumers, it's um, consumer as network satisfaction. Maybe they meet the letter of the law, but is it, do I feel okay about it? Is it really what I wanted? Do we feel accepting of it? Will we buy that product, for example, from Covered California? So we have CMS coming in. Larry described some of the regulations and the regulatory approaches. They're 
starting to take about um, exchange plans, for example, and the NAIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, and their Model Act. Um, and then Covered California, our exchange, also having active purchaser status. That is, they will also negotiate with the plans. They don't have to let all plans in. They can pick and choose, and they have contracts with these plans, and I'm sure Anne will talk more about how they're exercising that. So Marilyn said to me, so with all these players, so what's the best thing? You know, for, what works for California? And what, what I've said is that the Affordable Care Act is there and there are standards and we need them. All states need them. Some states need to come up in their network adequacy standards. They don't have anything much going on. Other states, like California, have really pretty rigorous standards. You know, going back to the Patients' Bill of Rights days, we had some pretty, um, pretty good things put in place in California. Um, but the, the federal ones need to be sort of a floor, set the minimum standards, um, and then allow states that have a, have a vision or an aspiration or a need based on their unique geography or market conditions to go further. And so um, similarly, the NAIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, they call it a model act, but from the consumer advocacy side, model is um, maybe not the, quite the right word because um, these are these acts, these model acts, are the product of a lot of negotiation amongst commissioners from all kinds of states, red states, blue states. Um, and so they can often be um, sort of a lower common denominator than, than we might like here in California, especially if we really like to push the envelope. So um, we do think the revisions that they're proposing are good ones. It was time to update the act, and we're really you know, pleased about those, but we want to push them even further. Um, and make it a real model that's sort of an aspirational model. I'm not, not sure we'll achieve that, but I think we have to give it a try. Um, so Marilyn also asked me to talk a little bit about the state of play in California. So what's what's going on here? If we have stronger rules, I've said California is, you know, we're, we're leading. We're aspirational and we're, we've got some good things from back in the olden days, which we do have, but why are we still having problems? And I think what it really comes down to is this is a very complicated thing to monitor and to regulate. Um, so we have room for improvement in our standards, it's true, but then it's not just having the standards, but actually enforcing them and having that ongoing monitoring system. And also aligning them between the two regulators, for example, um, the Department of Insurance and the Department of Managed Healthcare. I'll give you an example of um, a difference. So in 2002, we passed a law in California requiring that the regulators come up with um, standards for timely access to care. Because of the different um, political structures that they come from, one being an elected official, the other being appointed by the governor's <coughs> office, they did their own regulatory processes. And the Department of Insurance at that time um, it did geographic standards. You have to be, I think it's within 30 miles, um, 10 miles and 30 minutes from, a, from the consumer's um, uh, residence or workplace. And the Department of Managed Healthcare adopted a different standard, which was a timely access standard based on time, wait time for appointments. So we've got two, both very good, but different standards. And it makes for a very confusing marketplace. I, I would think also for the regulated entities, as well as for consumers to figure out what are the rules here exactly. Um, that the commissioner has just um, put forward emergency regulations, really um, very thorough, um, good ones. I think they got closer to aligning the two. They are, I would say, though, emergency regulations, and um, the Office of Administrative Law, as a procedural matter, has to approve them as, as emergency regulations. Um, and I think it, we'll wait to see if that, if that happens. And if it does, then they're only in effect for 180 days. So, you know, as in everything in healthcare, and especially around the Affordable Care Act, everything is always in flux. <coughs> so just don't take it as a given that those regs are, are yet in effect. Furthermore, around network adequacy, um, the regulators checking on this stuff are checking at a point in time. It's really a snapshot. When you file, you may have a perfectly adequate network. But maybe next month, doctors retire, they die, um, their contracts are terminated, whatever. So. It's, it's very difficult, I think, to keep up um, with the assumption that a network is an adequate one. Um, I will spare you the details of our exact um, standards for, for uh, network adequacy, um, unless you want them in a question and answer period. But um, it, it, we can't ignore the fact that in the early stages of open enrollment, the first open enrollment period, there were huge 
outcries um, from consumers about problems in narrowed networks, um, particularly came up around products in covered California. And what we believe that some of those networks really have broadened and improved. Um, I know Anthem said they have um, increased between um, January and August of 2014. They increased their networks by, I think, 3,800 doctors. Um, Blue Shield of California as well had a very narrow network in Alameda County that was just Alameda. You couldn't go outside Alameda County for your care. They broadened that to allow people to come across the bay to get providers. So there definitely has been, whether it's from public pressure, from journalism, uh, from regulators, from Covered California, for whatever reasons, the plans did start to broaden things and broaden their networks. And um, we hope that in 2015 we'll, um, we'll find that people are more satisfied with those. <coughs> the Department of Managed Healthcare as well, um, because of complaints they've gotten about network adequacy, um, did what they call a non-routine survey, it's sort of like an audit um, of the two biggest plans in the exchange, um, Anthem and Blue Shield of California. And I think that's in your packet, actually, the, um, the findings that came out in November of 2014. And they made some significant findings. They did find that in Anthem, 12% of the providers were not at the location listed, 13% were not accepting new patients. And in addition, um, that, that uh, more than 10% of the providers had changed in the network from the original filing and that they should have reported that and didn't. So there are those findings out there by the, um, by the Department of Managed Health Care. As well, there are a couple of lawsuits. You've probably written about them or certainly read about them. Um, some against Anthem that involve the adequacy of their pharmacy networks. Um, for HIV patients, they were requiring people to um, use their mail <coughs> service and not go to the community pharmacy. In essence, the community pharmacies were becoming out-of-network uh, pharmacies with much higher cost. And that's been challenged in a couple of lawsuits. Anthem as well, there are at least three lawsuits that I know of, um, challenging them for um, allegations of misrepresentation of networks, false listings in provider directories, um, giving consumers information about the narrowing of the networks, not, not until it was too late to change plans. Um, so uh, these suits go on. Um, I want to take a minute to talk about provider directories as well. Larry, Larry raised that point as well. These are the problems with provider directories are age-old problems. They predate the ACA, but I think they're really taking on new meaning and importance and visibility because the ACA actually gives us a chance now to shop for insurance because there's no more pre-existing uh, condition exclusions. We have array of plans both on and off the exchange, um, people are really now getting the first chance to really, really dig into them and use them. And our research shows exactly what Larry was saying, that people care about two things when they're choosing a plan. Premium is number one, and closely behind that was who, who my provider is. Um, so it's vitally important that people know when they're choosing a plan, and then of course when they go to use the plan as well, they need to know who's in the network and out of the network because, if, as you know, if someone's out of network, the costs can rise very considerably and end up with those surprise medical bills. Um, so we think it's really time to update the law about provider directories. The original laws in California that were written, <coughs> that are on the books now, were written more than a decade ago, and that was the era of paper, the dark ages. Um, and now we are in a whole new world, and with web-based directories, it should be somewhat, maybe a good deal easier to update them more frequently um, and less expensively. Uh, we know we'll probably never get to 100% accuracy because of the nature of the continual change, but um, certainly we should, have, we should have better accuracy. Cover California, um, to its credit, did try to do a consolidated directory because of some of the things Larry mentioned about the inconsistencies among plans and frankly the inaccuracies, inaccuracies that are in the plans themselves right now, um, it was difficult to get a really accurate consolidated directory so they, they took that down. Um, but I think that it's maybe a little unfair criticism that the exchange got because all they did was use the data that they were given by the plans, which in some cases was not up to date. Um, in Medi-Cal, I just don't want to neglect Medi-Cal either because it's a huge population in California. Um, those directories as well have been found to have very significant flaws and um, some good reporting from by the Hannah Guzik, is it? Um, at California Health Report, that her secret shopper investigation of those directories I think was really had some really significant findings 
that more than half of the doctors, for example, in um, directories in three counties were not accepting new patients. And um, so this calls into question also, you know, are the networks adequate as well as the directories being inaccurate? Oh, but doesn't that also call into question Medi-Cal? I mean, they, you know, they, they're famous for paying doctors very low amounts, and so, and then to turn around and say, oh, we can't find enough doctors. That's a problem. No, yeah. no question. That's an, another age-old problem. Um, so, um, we really think that several improvements need to be made and can be made in the directories, and within the next week or two, um, Senator Ed Hernandez, who's the chair of the Senate Health Committee, is going to introduce a bill, um, asking you to watch for it. Um, Consumers Union is a co-sponsor of it to try to um, update the law on directories to make the updating requirements more frequent, um, make it easier for people to report inaccuracies and to get them corrected, um, to create maybe a standard template, um, and to use these directories as well for checking again, as a sort of a checkpoint against network adequacy. Um, finally, the point that Marilyn also asked me to touch on is consumer interests and provider interests. I certainly don't speak for providers. I'm not a provider. I never have been. But um, I, I can say just a couple things about that, which is that in this environment, um, it's sometimes the case that provider and consumer interests will align. Um, not that providers are all in monolithic groups. Some, as you know, are supportive of the ACA. Others opposed it. Um, but certainly, for example, on the provider directories, there's going to be um, a natural alignment for the most part. I mean, they would like accurate directories, and consumers need them. Um, Two things that come to mind about areas of difference um, are around the issue of balanced billing. That is, um, consumers would like to see in those situations where they have to go to an out-of-network provider um, an assurance that they're not going to get billed for the, um, any difference in what the provider got from what the insurer gave them, from what their actual bill charges are. Um, and providers don't always like that. Now, we already have law in California for those plans um, regulated by the Department of Managed Health Care in emergency situations. If you're in an emergency situation, um, you can't be um, billed by the provider for any difference in amount um, from what the insurer received. But there are gaps in the law there um, <coughs> where, where consumers and some providers will. That's the, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite understand that if you go out of network, the consumer wants to know that they that they're not going to get billed. Charged they, for right, they're not going to get charged for the for it's an out of network provider right. who would have gotten a larger amount. They they, they billed for a larger amount than yes. they actually received yes. from the insurance plan. And so sometimes what happens is they are protected within in their cost sharing of the health plan, but they're not protected in terms of the provider. And the provider may come to them, which happened to me, by the way, in the past year. Um, with a surgery at an in-network facility, but an anesthesiologist who yes. wasn't in-network, who came back with a $900 bill. Good. Isn't yeah. this also the case with CDI, not having the protections through CDI plans versus... Yeah. That's correct. So you get a separate That's bill because it was on network, so you get billed. Oh, so you are doing an in-network procedure, and unbeknownst to you, you have an out-of-network yeah. provider, yeah. part yes. of the team. Correct. Okay, so now I understand. Sometimes it's emergency, and as Larry described, sometimes it's a surgery that's been set up in advance, but you... I thought I thought you meant I go to an out-of-network specialist for my... On your, you know, on your own. For my dermatologist. Your own and, yeah, so oh, now I see. Okay, fine. States have pretty part of actually outlawed balance billing in California, too. So, but in emergency situations. In emergency situations, yeah. for those plans licensed by the Department of Managed Health Care. Yeah. Which is most of them, but still, right. like, there are gaps. Yeah. Um, and then the, the one other place of possible difference with physicians, between physicians and consumers that I can see is frankly around narrow networks. Um, because narrower networks, if they really do cut costs and cut premiums and are sufficient, um, that might not be a bad thing. I mean, we do need to control costs, and um, I'm not sure all physicians would feel free about that. So, trying to find the differences for Maryland. I, I, I specifically <laughs> asked our panelists to um, talk a little bit about the provider perspective and the um, uh, plan perspective, uh, even though they're not providers of plans, because as you notice, we don't have them represented here in the panel, or else we would be here at probably another <laughs> very long panel. Um, okay, so. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So let's move to uh, Anne of Portland, Cover, California. I'll pass the mic down. Are you actually hearing anything on the mic? Is that okay? Okay. Can we Good evening, everybody. Um, I wanted to start my presentation today with a quick story, and uh, I like to do this when giving presentations to provide some context. But when my daughter was just uh, shy of six months old, she was diagnosed with neuroblastoma, which is a cancerous tumor that was found in her chest area. And I won't go into details how lucky we were that we found it so soon, but I will tell you about the results. And my daughter is now a beautiful 17-year-old girl who will be attending Oregon State this fall and um, majoring in science, and she wants to become a doctor. The relationship that I had with her team of doctors throughout her life has been very personal and based on complete trust. I have experienced the notification that my daughter's pediatric oncologist was no longer uh, covered by my insurance. And so what did I do? Well, I researched my choices. I looked at the plan choices that my husband and I were able to obtain through our employer coverage. I did lots of checking between plan directories to make certain that the new plan I was considering had my doctor in their network. And imagine this 17 years ago, as we've already talked about, um, directories weren't online. They were books, they were paper books, and as soon as you got them, they were probably already outdated. Um, if you called the provider office, they generally didn't know what plan they were contracted with and they did not know what product generally they were contracted with. So the only way to confirm with some degree of certainty was to call the health plan physically, get them on the phone, and confirm um, if the provider was in their network. So I eventually was able to change through open enrollment to a new plan where I was, and I was, I did have our, we did have our oncologist in network. So if we flash forward today, um, as you know, things are much different, and we've talked about this, our provider directories are online, but are they any more accurate? And um, provider offices seem to be more engaged with understanding what insurances, uh, insurance they take, but really do they, they know? And I think in the early days of the AC, we found that they didn't know. There's a lot of confusion. So who has the responsibility of making sure consumers are choosing plans um, where they're able to see the provider they wish to see? And who has the responsibility of making certain that the provider information is as accurate as possible given this constant degree of change? And I would say that the responsibility is shared between health plans, medical providers, regulators, and consumers. I will also say that at Covered California, we do believe we have a responsibility too, and that responsibility is to make sure that we offer our, our consumers meaningful choice in all areas of the state, and that we work with our contracted health plans to make sure that we can provide as much transparency as we can, given the technology limitations that we have, and we want our consumers to make educated plan choices. So I will agree with uh, both Larry and Betsy that narrow networks have been around for a while. In fact, I'll go even further to, further to say, Larry, that they are already in the employer group market. And in fact, CalPERS in 2005 limited their hospital provider networks significantly with Blue Shield by cutting out um, high cost providers in, throughout the state. And then in 2008, they further limited their um, physician profile and had it their first narrow network um, by medical groups. So I want to start with consumer choice because for Cover California, consumer choice is a combination of the plans that we have available and in what areas that we have them available. And there's been a lot of talk about this lately. The majority of our members have three carriers to choose from in the state of California. And so among those carriers, and there's also these different metal, metal tiers, so there's, there's quite a portfolio for members to choose from. But there are approximately 11% or 120,000 members that have two plans or less, two carriers, I should say, or less. And 3% of that, 29,000, only have one carrier. These areas are, are in Northern California, Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito. 
And this is not new. This is not new to the ACA. The, 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 the plans have always had difficulty contracting um, with providers in these areas because there's not as much competition. And they need to be able to deliver, um, to have contracts in place that they can deliver a rate that will be affordable. So even so, if we know this exists, we still recognize that it's important for our members to have choice, and we are currently working with our contracted health plans to expand coverage in these areas, and we have made some progress. And in fact, um, just at the board meeting last week, our board did approve to allow new plan entrance in 2016 <coughs> to specific geographic areas where uh, we have limited plan choice, and our current uh, plan partners have stepped up to the plate to uh, further expand in some regions as well. Quickly, just can you tell us what the plans are? Is the list too long to go into right now? Um, I can't tell you where the plans are. Well, I can tell you where the plans are proposed to expand to so that there will be complete plan choice, and that would be in the areas of Placer and El Dorado County, Monterey, and there are areas in Northern uh, California, but Northern California will still be open because we still have areas where there's only two plan choices. And the only reason I can't tell you which plans are expanding is because that hasn't been done yet. It'll be for 2016. Okay. So, um, again, the board has made the decision that we will allow new plans to submit applications, and um, this was just approved last week. But I want to stress the importance that when we look at the plans that have submitted applications, what we're looking for are the, that the plans offer varying network options with contracted providers that do not overlap. It wouldn't be of much value to consumers if we had seven plans that all had the same provider network. The goal would be to have an offering of the different providers throughout the state so members can make this choice to choose a plan that their provider is in and not be limited to plans that do not cover their, their providers. And currently, um, we just did this analysis, we have currently across all plans 61,000 unique physicians. And what that is, is it's greater than 75% of all active licensed non-hospital based physicians in California. So I would say that that's not very network. We, have, we would love it to be to 100, you can never be to 100, it's not all providers who contract with health plans. but. Um, you know, greater than 75 is certainly in the second year of the ACA um, a good number to have. In terms of hospitals, there's greater than 90 percent of all licensed acute care hospitals in covered or, sorry in, Cal in California. So another area of focus um, related to uh, providers is that we are interested, and Larry had referred to it as. Um, uh, essential community providers and we don't limit ourselves to essential community providers we also look at an expanded list but one thing that we do is we get provider data from our health plans on a quarterly basis and just starting in 2014 um, we worked with our largest contracted health plans um, there's four and that com that take that covers about 88 percent of our population and we overlay their provider information with uh, census data as well as covered California data to understand areas throughout the state that have more vulnerable populations based on income and there's access, potential access issues. And we met with each of the health plans to let them know where they were at in terms of contracting with these providers in some of these areas. And we'll be meeting again with them this quarter to see what kind of progress they've made. And, and this is something that we have a, a contract performance uh, guarantee in place with our plans that they have to meet a certain threshold for essential community providers. And so finally, we've already talked about this a bit, but with regards to transparency. So it's one thing that we have all of um, a great amount of providers, but it's now getting that information into the hands of our consumers so they can make appropriate choices for, for themselves and their families. And um, 
it would be ideal if we were able to have a cross-plan provider directory that members could look at and easily determine what carrier had their providers. And I know, Larry, you referred to the um, LA Times, and, and that data was taken from Cover California with a PRA request. Um, but if you looked further into that detail, the detail still had the same issues that, of course, the provider directory that we put up had, and that's because that information is coming from the plans, and as the audits had pointed out, you know, that, that information is not as accurate as it could be. So we're interested in having that, but at the point where we're at, with the DMHC audits that occurred and with the issues that were found, the plans are taking correction, correct, correction and actions on their provider um, data to improve the, the directory. And so we're not really at a point where we believe we can offer anything of value. And I would say that we're still understanding if Cover California is the right place to provide that because as Betsy talked about, we have, we have Medi-Cal too. And so who is the right um, entity to put <coughs> in a statewide provider directory. So as we figure that out, there could be an interim option. One thing that we're looking at is could we have a limited directory that's limited to hospitals, understanding that it doesn't change as often as the medical providers. And so that's that's an option that we, we could look at. But we still, um, you know, considering what I talked about at the beginning of this presentation, we have come a long way since paper. And our consumers do have the ability to look at a plan through their link and look at their provider directory or what providers are available by each plan before selecting a plan. And I'd like to ask a question about the statement you made earlier on this topic, which was that there's a shared responsibility to understand um, network uh, yeah. coverage amongst all these different stakeholders. Um, as a consumer advocate myself, though, I, I worry that if no one has the ultimate responsibility, then someone is, I mean, there's potential for the consumer to never have the clarity that he or she needs. So what are the perspectives, for example, on the provider, for example, being responsible for sharing that information? Um, and, and to throw my own story in here, I recently visited my dentist. Now, luckily, my bill balance billing issue was only $70 or something like that. But I was surprised to find my dentist is no longer in network. And I sure would have liked to have known that um, you know, at the time that I scheduled my appointment, or at least when I showed up for my appointment. Um, I can imagine for many people that issue is a $1,000 or a $10,000 issue. So, um I think I heard a couple questions. So ultimately, um, in California, the regulators, I would say, have the responsibility of ensuring that the plans have um, accurate provider data. They have, they have to assure that the plans have adequate um, provider capacity, access requirements. However, as you pointed out, the, the providers also have a responsibility. They don't have the ultimate responsibility, but they do have a responsibility to the health plans to inform them of their changes. Now, health plans have typically in their contracts with their with their providers that they have to inform the health plan of any changes, but there's, I, I would say there's probably not a whole lot of action taken if the provider does not do that. Uh, with the DMHC audit, I know that, again, there's corrections that are being made, and I think some of that would have to do with the plans are implementing surveys to take a portion of their um, directories and see if the, the provider is actually active, but there that's just a portion, that's not the whole directory, so there is that responsibility and I'm not certain how um, plans can hold those providers accountable to that. Um, but I do also believe, um, again, the regulators have the ultimate authority, but the plans have that responsibility and they sure they, they can do whatever they can to make their um, directories as, as accurate as possible. It's still indirect though. As a patient, I have to go to the insurance company before I go to my provider. Could we short circuit that and have the provider take responsibility for communicating that since it's a provider's decision whether or not to be part of the network to begin with? N not today. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think you can hold a provider accountable for giving information and they cover the bill. Now, if the health plan says a provider's in their network, generally, you know, do something about that. And I think there, I just read that um, in one of the articles that was in there, but 
I was going to say, it's not always the provider's choice. Sometimes the insurance company drops the provider, mm -hmm. so, and, and the mm -hmm. provider doesn't always know that they're dropped. And I will tell you from what Cover California is doing on that aspect um, before I finish up, but we did recently, within the last month, have a big push of a um, provider relationship campaign where we're working with the ACA, we're working with the hospital association, we're working with different entities to um, get the message out that their provider, their provider organizations and that members of those organizations are or are not accepting Covered California with information that we have. Now ultimately the, the provider should be confirming with their health plan, but we're also taking that step to help um, get that message out there and use the data that we have to communicate that with providers as well. So, um, so what? In just in closing, I think that uh, what I was getting to was that we have come a long way, but there's still obviously a lot of improvement that we um, need to make. And I know that Covered California, and I personally um, believe that we do need to have better information so our consumers can make uh, informed choices when they're choosing their plan. And, and to that degree, we'll continue to work um, with different entities to to to. Prep the Sorry, to um, try and improve the information that's available. Okay, thank you, Anne. So let's turn finally to Emily, who's going to give us an on the ground perspective and tell us what she's been hearing from readers. Great, thank you. Um, so, yes, I'm going to uh, give you the consumer perspective because that's what I cover and what I write about. But I'm also going to come from obviously the journalist perspective, so that means I may be challenging some of the things that have been said here. Um, as Marilyn said earlier, I write a column, it's called Ask Emily, and it is uh, completely consumer driven, completely consumer oriented, uh, Q&A about Obamacare, um, in which I answer consumers' direct questions about the Affordable Care Act. And in fact, today we sent off um, Ask Emily number 47 to our um, newspaper and radio station partners across the state. And I, honestly, I never thought I would get to 47, and, and, and that's in part because well, I, I didn't um, stupidly anticipate how complicated this law was, and nor did I anticipate what a mess the rollout of this um, of the implementation would be. Even though California did a good job, you know, God help the other states if that was the case. Um, so today I've received, you know, people, consumers are so desperate for information and for guidance. It's a very hard law um, and, and they have to jump through a lot of hoops. To date, I have received uh, more than 2,100 uh, emails, comments, questions um, to my Ask Emily email address. And I'd like you guys to take a wild guess as to what the number one complaint has been. Networks. 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 And in all fairness, and I'll bring this up later, that has gone down. Though that was primarily last year. But narrow networks have been the number one complaint. And when consumers you know, write into me about this, they don't use the term narrow networks. Instead, they write about three kind of broad areas that I'll mention to you. And the first is access. Um, and these complaints are basically people that are saying, I can't find a doctor that's near to me that's in my new Covered California plan or private market plan. Or more commonly, and this is a kind of a culture shift that's happening, my doctor, whom I love dearly, is no longer, or does not accept the new Covered California plan. So access is the first area. The second one is a big one, and that's accuracy. And we've talked a lot about that today, but a lot of consumer complaints are about accuracy. People are calling doctors and are being told, or they were, less now, being told that they're a network, and then they show up at the office, and then they're told, no, we're not a network. And um, so people are having a very hard time. There's a lot of unreliable, inaccurate information out there. And this is huge because people's livelihoods in many ways can be at stake. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, but um, accuracy is at the root of some of these lawsuits that Betsy mentioned uh, against Anthem and others and also was the root of the audits or investigation or whatever you want to call what the Department of Managed Health Care uh, looked into and found ultimately that those two big insurers, the two biggest in covered California, right, um, had misrepresentation of 25% of the 
each of them of the providers in their in their uh, lists. Um, the third category of complaints is cost, and that goes to what you said. And so when what's a, a lot of what's happening, Larry mentioned it earlier, is when consumers go to a doctor or hospital who they were told were in network, some of them are receiving unexpected bills for ultimately up to thousands of dollars uh, for inadvertently going out of network. One of my columns um, that I hoped you guys would have in the packet, but I don't think you do, but it's, it's uh, I think it's listed. Um, it's about how, we heard a lot about how there were out of network, excuse me, out of pocket maximums in the covered California and private market plans of $6,350 last year for an individual and $12,700 for a uh, family. You didn't hear a lot about the fact that that's only for in-network use. And when you have inaccuracy out there and bad information out there and people inadvertently going out of network, they're coming to realize the hard way that in some cases, especially with EPOs and PPOs, there are no, in some cases, out-of-pocket maximums for out-of-network use. Or they're $10,000, $20,000, $30,000. And a lot of people didn't know that going into their plans because it was very hard to see. So, you know, as Larry mentioned, what happens when you go to a hospital and you're going under, how do you know? You know, you've checked with the doctors going to be in your network. You know that the hospital's going to be in your network. How do you know that that little chunk they took out of your ear isn't going to be looked at by a pathologist who's in your network? How do you know? And so I get, I've been getting a lot of complaints about this from consumers who have received not hundreds of thousand dollars in bills, but twelve, thirteen hundred, ten thousand dollars, that kinds of thing, that kind of thing. And then just a reminder, we're not just talking about covered California. These are also the exact same plans that are sold in covered California with the exact same benefits are sold on the private market at the exact same unsubsidized price, which also means they have the exact same networks. So that's something to consider as journalists. Um, and again, in all fairness, I want to mention that things are improving. The number of complaints that I've received from consumers about narrow networks has dropped. But they're still coming in, and I want to read you um, from an email I got very recently from a woman. And this is some really interesting twists. You wouldn't, you wouldn't expect it. Larry, you alluded to this earlier. So this woman needed a mammogram, and she um, has a covered California plan, and she checked. She seemed like she did a very good job doing her homework trying to do her homework. She checked to find out that the hospital that she was going to get the mammogram at was in her network, and it was. And then I'll quote from her, quote, lo and behold, I get a bill from the physician group responsible for reading the mammogram. It turns out that even though I did due diligence in finding a mammogram provider within my service area, the provider they used was to read the mammogram was not in my service area. How would I know this? What good is an x-ray if there's no one to read it? And then, and then she says, I diligently checked to make sure the facility doing the mammogram was on the list given me by my insurance company, but the facility blithely neglects to mention that they use out-of-service providers. I would have never have guessed. Um, so things are getting better, but consumers are still going to be coming up against a lot of problems with narrow networks. Um, but wasn't the mammogram, the screening mammogram, wasn't that this particular this individual and very specific test, wasn't that supposed to be with no co no cost share? You know, and I went back to her, I said, yeah, I mean, yeah, and now that what Larry mentioned, I did, I went back to her and I said, you've got to go fight this, but da so she's fighting it and it looks like she's going to be fine. But that, you know, fighting it is not fun. And it's not easy and it takes a lot of time and that's another pet peeve of mine, you know, now that I'm kind of in this role as, in, as a kind of a consumer advocate, as well as being a German journalist, it's one thing to tell, it, it's, it's easy to tell people, just call DMHC's help center, you know, just petition your, go to a hearing with Covered California, it's not easy and it's not fun. So, anyway, okay. So, as journalists covering this issue, um, here are some questions that I have asked, and I suggest you ask, and, and you've mentioned some of these things. Who's responsible? Who is responsible for these issues? Who has oversight? It's not always obvious, and it may not always 
um, be the answer, you, yeah, maybe you ought to push back against what you're hearing as the answer. In California, we, as we've discussed, we've got the two regulatory bodies, which is so messy. And, um, but with due respect, what about Cover California? I have been frustrated as a journalist when I call Cover California and I'm about narrow networks and I'm told, we're sorry, we're not the regulators. But Covered California is an active purchaser, and Covered California does have, chose to take on this role as an active purchaser, which gives them more power and authority in negotiations with the, with the, with the plans and determining what benefits they offer. Um, so, I don't know, I'd say push back on that a little bit. Also, doesn't Covered California have some kind of responsibility to provide accurate information about providers? Um, why can't Cover California tell plans, no, you can't have unlimited out-of-pocket maximums for out-of-network use? Why can't they set some kind of maximum? I know that goes into broader questions about cost. <laughs> we can get into that later. Um, and doctors, that's another great question. Um, Beth Capel of Health Access brought up a very good point when I was chatting with her recently about Doctors are a problem in terms of narrow networks because a lot of doctors don't want to participate in these in these narrow networks. They don't get paid and they don't feel they get paid enough to participate in some of the covered California plans. So, you know, I don't know how much to get into this to get into this, but consumers also, you know, part of this is a culture shift for consumers, and it's about messaging. And pay attention to the messaging that people are getting about. Um, the Affordable Care Act and about networks. This goes back to big picture messaging from President Obama telling people that they could keep their plans and their doctors and Peter Lee telling people that dealing with covered California would be as easy as shopping on Amazon. It didn't quite turn out to be the case and people I think were taken aback. But it's also about the details as I've mentioned before. Messaging is in the details. You never heard anybody talk about the out-of-pocket maximums for out-of-network use, but you heard a lot about in-network use. And so I think a lot of consumers were blindsided by that. So um, finally, I wanted to mention that there's no insurer on this panel, and but there is a representative here <laughs> for the insurance companies. Sorry, Nicole. It, it's um, Nicole Kasabian Evans. Right. She's the Cal California Association of Health Plans. And I, I got a call from Anthem Blue Cross Sterile Ing, you guys probably deal with. He wanted to make sure, and I think it's fair, that, that, that their perspective is a bit represented here. So I had a conversation with him yesterday, and some of this was already brought up. He said that Anthem has spent um, millions of dollars uh, working to fix some of the problems with narrow networks. Um, he said that Anthem has reached out to every single doctor in its covered California networks to try to ensure that there are no discrepancies or fewer discrepancies in the um, uh, provider directories, and he said that it's added 6,000 doctors in the last year, um, including a lot of big hospitals like we've talked about, Cedar sinai and all the UC hospitals. So, um, so again, you know, I'm coming from this perspective as a, a journalist, but also now in this new role as kind of a consumer advocate writing this column, and, and I'm frustrated on behalf of consumers who by and large are trying to do the right thing and are trying to jump through all these hoops, but, you know, the best advice I can give them, and it's the best advice a lot of experts give them, is to do, do your homework. That's what I always hear. Do your homework. Find out ahead of time. But it's not fair advice when doing your homework is so difficult and, in fact, impossible in some cases. There you go. Great. So thank you. Let's open up to uh, Q&A. Oh, if you could please identify yourself. Oh, I had some comments. Um, I wear different hats. I used to be a mathematician. I was an underwriter for a major carrier. And um, I was a 19, or 2006 um, California Endowment Fellow, so Larry looks really familiar. <laughs> and, um, but I've been, for the last almost 15 years, I've been an enforcement attorney for the Department of Insurance. So I just wanted to say, um, narrow networks was very overt in the 80s and 90s because you had managed care. That was a way to regulate the rates and everything, but that was also limiting choices for people. Um, that was more over, and now people don't know, and so your lab tests could be sent somewhere. Um, so for Emily, the consumer advocate, um, 
one thing that your, the person could do is actually call the insurance company and say, I have no choice where my labs were being sent. And actually, I learned this not through my work, but just through the networks, trying to find out how to solve problems outside of our consumer hotline. By the way, the CDI consumer hotline is 1-800-927-HELP. Um, so that's for traditional insurance plans, and if you're an HMO prepaid plan, that's DMHC. Um, so there's really so there's really no transparency at breaks because with narrow networks, you don't even know what you're buying. And only when you're buying health care products do you not know what you're getting because you think you're buying something, but things change. And even if you were Medicare Part D, the, the drug formularies can change from month to month. And as an attorney, I would say, that's a breach of contract because I thought I was buying this. When I signed it for this and I looked and I read the contract, this is what I was getting. And unfortunately, Prop 45 did not pass. I, and what I say today is not reflective of the Department of Insurance. I have to do that disclaimer. I, I speak from personal experience and, and the views that I express are those of my own. But it's not one politician determining the rates. We have actuaries. Many people don't know what actuaries are. I was taking actuarial exams, but it was faster to go to law school and <laughs> um, pass the bar exam. But there's actuaries, there's attorneys, and there's financial analysts at the Department of Insurance who determine what our rates, and this would have been posted on our website to let consumers know what the um, components of the rates are. So I don't know if another Prop 45 will creep up. Uh, the insurance commissioner doesn't like to give up, so I, I think that there might be something, but that's really something that needs to be posted on the website for consumers. And who can argue with transparency? So now we're working with UCSF on hospital service and just general rate transparency. Because you don't know what you're getting when you're going to a hospital. Now the slings are you purchase separately. And you think when you're going in for a broken arm, everything's covered. But that's not the case. The other thing is really, uh, well, the other thing is I want to know in terms of access, we haven't discussed anything about language access. So if we're all English proficient and we all have college education and we can go on to the net, what about people who don't have access to the net? What about people who aren't English proficient? Do you mean with sign-ups, or do you mean with actually I'm talking about just healthcare. access and doing homework. I mean, let's say they do have a plan, and they've been encouraged to do the plan. And San Francisco were really good because we had healthy San Francisco, and then they were weaned off and moved over to cover California, those who are eligible. But I don't think we've done a good job for the many immigrants we have in our state, um, and particularly covered California. So with regards to the languages, we do have um, our basic documents are in uh, English, Spanish, and um, the third one I'm, I'm not quite sure. But then all documents have a reference to all, I think it's Chinese, yeah. too. <laughs> all um, other notices that we sent out are um, reference where they can be available in all different languages. Now that's just strictly for covered California. Now you're asking them when they go to the plans to get some information. I, I, I would have to, you know, I'm not the plans, but I'm sure the plans would also have that language uh, translation as well. But for covered California, we do have um, our information in three languages. And like I said, notices are available in um, lots of different languages. Other questions? Or is, are you aware of that? Or? Well, no, no, I am aware of it, but I don't know if it's really adequate because everything's available in English. And as Emily demonstrates, how many people still have questions and fall into the cracks? And so then in terms of Spanish, we have um, a number, and we increased that number significantly for open enrollment this year in Spanish-speaking um, customer service reps that members call. In particular, in the Latino population, those members do prefer to call and they have called and we've, like I said, we've increased that population. So some of those things are being addressed. Um, I could just, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Your point is well taken in the sense that consumers have a hard enough time, very educated, English speaking consumers have a really hard time understanding out of network and, and other issues. So in a state like California with the huge non-English speaking population, we, we, probably do need to do a whole lot more. Um, in the provider directory world, we're going to try to see if we can make sure that at least the languages spoken by the doctor and clinical staff are added and uniformly. I mean, some plans already do that, but others don't. Um, but there, there's always more that we have to do. As in California, essential documents are supposed to be translated into the threshold languages. And in Medi-Cal, 
Um, I think they do a, a pretty extraordinary job in terms of getting translations done, but it's not across the board in all, all plans. So it's a good one. Okay, so Vicki Culliver of the Crown. Sure. I have two um, questions. One is, are there no consumer laws or something to protect um, folks that get consumers against being responsible for charges to which they had no idea were going to happen? I mean, can that just happen? And there's That's nothing... what the lawsuits are about. I know, but <laughs> so there's... I mean, the burden seems to be really on the consumers, just, actually, to... Well, it, yeah, I mean, there's 17200 is the Unfair and Deceptive Practices Act, and that's what I think, I haven't seen the legal pleadings, but I think that's what some of these cases are brought under. In other words, it was deceptive that X was represented and it wasn't the <coughs> It has to be proven. And the Department of Managed Health Care, for example, and, and the Department of Insurance have their own rules, but only the regulators can enforce those. So it's not absolutely clear-cut and easy for consumers to assert it's bizarre. Their there's, no, I mean, there's no explicit rule that says if I go to an in-network hospital, all the services I get will be in-network. Right. That is certainly right. the case. Well, I would think that somehow be addressed somewhere, that the fact is, if, you know, everyone's using out-of-network, in network, if, and then who gets stuck with things as the consumer? Do you think that would be said? That's been going on for a while now. Yeah, it's, it's very, Why is it? It's yeah. very, yeah, back, back to this issue of who's, who's responsible. It's very hard to figure out who would be responsible for that. I mean, if you think about the insurer, um, we don't have an insurer on the panel, but you think about the insurer, so the insurer contracts with this hospital to be in their network. Um, they also contract with, uh, with with labs. They also contract with specialists, with surgeons. Um, the, the insurer has no has no direct control over whether the hospital is actually working with all those ancillary providers. Um, you can hold the hospital responsible, but the hospital's not necessarily responsible for which plans those ancillary providers are contracting with either. So it's it's very it's 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 a tricky it's a tricky Actually, problem. Larry, right? and you me you mentioned when you mentioned I had a question about that that these emergency regulations did, did, isn't that what you said that they will require people to be informed? Do the hospitals even know who's going to be on call that day so that they can tell you? Yeah, I, I wondered the, the I same thing. There I know. And I, it's it's also in the um, NAAC model act or some of the revisions that are proposed that notices will be given, but. I don't know that they actually can tell that for sure. You so can let's call have a, the insurer and I'll take rep, it off. Uh, weigh in on this. Yeah, I mean, there was a great. Off, please, again? The, the, yeah, I'm Nicole Sabian Evans with the California Association of Health Plan. There was a really good New York Times piece about this toward the end, last few months of the last year. And um, I mean, this is a really complicated issue, like Larry said, because the hospitals, the people who work in hospitals are not on staff for the hospital, right? So they, this was like kind of, they called it drive-by doctoring in the article because a physician, a surgeon in the OR might have a, a colleague walk into the OR and consult last minute and it's not necessarily uh, run through any kind of an insurance process to see if that is indeed, um, that physician is in network. And so these things happen all the time, especially in a hospital setting. That, it's that really description was even more insidious, though, that Times article, because oh, yeah. as I recall, it was calling in your friend to do a consult so that they could make a lot of money off the procedure. It wasn't just, oh, I'm on the team, and whoops, I'm not in network. I mean, it was. Right. It's a, so it shows how complicated it is, though, right? I mean. But I'll also say when I delivered my daughter in 2001, 16 months later, I got an anesthesiology bill <laughs> for an out-of-network <laughs> epidural. It's just because it has been going on for so long. Oh, yeah. I don't understand. You know, just to me, it's just bizarre. It's amplified now. Yeah, yeah. It, is. It, is. Yeah. it is. Yeah, it is. I'm just saying that it just is. Yeah. It's also we didn't talk about. You know, for we now have a lot more people buying coverage on their own through mm -hmm. Covered California. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if you get coverage for an employer, you at least have an HR department who is uh, who is your Emily. Um, you know, if you're buying it on your own, you uh, you, you know you're on your own, and um, you, you really don't have. So I was gonna say, I actually called the California Medical Association because I was trying to help a friend, and so I contact. I ended up contacting the director of economic services. She recommended having my friend call the insurance company directly and say, "I had no choice. I didn't know where my labs were being sent," and the insurance company took off all the charges. So. For those of you who are in attendance here, here's that little yeah. secret thing that will work for a little while. I have another question. I'll so get someone in the lobby. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just to add to this, a couple of you mentioned that uh, uh, plans are 
starting to add providers back in. So just how far is the pendulum swinging back? Do you know, Nicole? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, <laughs> so, I, you know, I'll give me a short perspective. Yeah. Um, California did a really good job of enrolling people, and it was so good <laughs> that uh, the plants hadn't anticipated such robust enrollment, so they had to actually move quickly to build out on those networks. And, and I mean, so some of those complaints may be, I mean, it might be a little bit of a growing pain process. We'll see. You know, I mean, this was year one, and, you know, nobody knew what enrollment was going to be. Everybody was a little nervous about how far on a limb, because we're offering really low premiums, are we going to be able to cover all of our costs? So I think that... Um, you're learning, you know, you're seeing now, okay, so enrollment will kind of normalize, the, the insurers will have a better idea about how many doctors they need because they know what their enrollment's going to be. So I, you know, I hope that we see some kind of balancing out here as we gain more experience. The other thing I feel compelled to bring up in representing health plans is the cost issue that nobody's talked about and Emily alluded to. And I know it's really hard and frustrating to have limitations put on which provider you can see and, and um, why you get charged for going out, get extra for going out of network. But if we don't have a system in which we are balancing all of these cost issues, the consumers will really be out of luck because the price of premiums will be through the roof. So I, you know, I don't. It, it, it's a difficult process we're going through right now, and I think we're learning our way through it, but we've got to keep in mind that that premium level has got to be at a point in which people can actually purchase it. And so I think that's the delicate balancing act that we're all trying to work out right now. And in some ways, this is about a culture shift, right? I mean, it's a, and people aren't used to it and wouldn't expect it. And that's part of the reason I was talking about messaging. I think that if people were kind of told more openly and honestly, you might lose, you might have to have a new doctor. You're going to lose your plan. It'll suck, but you're going to have health insurance that you can rely on. And more Americans will and will be a healthier society. People would have been maybe more girded for it. But the messaging was the opposite. Yeah, that was. So that's, spoken as a journalist, not as a politician. That's, <laughs> yeah. 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 that started right up at the top. Yeah, exactly. Too. It would suck, right? <laughs> we, did, we did a um, survey. The um, National Association of um, Insurance Commissioners Consumer Representatives did a survey of state regulators around the country, and I think 38 responded. And the number, and they were asked, what was the number one difficulty that you had around networks in particular? And they said, it's explaining and really getting consumers to understand about in-network, out-of-network, what it all means. And so that you could go in two directions with that information. One is we need better education for consumers, which we do need. But the other direction, which I come back to, is it's not just about notice and education. It's also about creating products that are understandable. And it's so complex, so convoluted, and so non-standardized in many ways um, that it's very hard for people to understand it. Nobody could get that educated. So we've got to do both. But So one thing I'm seeing from some people who, uh, who write to, from readers I hear from too, is um, just, I, I'm going to go to Kaiser. Because then I don't have to ever worry about it. I get the same thing. And I'm, I'm wondering oh. if, um, if uh, where, where is Kaiser in gaining market share by a covered <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Is that out yet? Well, no, we haven't announced um, the the enrollment yet. But I mean, as as you saw, Kaiser's premiums they had negative uh, premium increases in 2015. So I think what you would suspect or expect to see is that there's an increase in, in Kaiser. But that's that is a narrow network, so to speak. Those members are going to Kaiser, and they will see Kaiser doctors. And it's easy, but the, it's a limited network. Mm -hmm. So we'll take uh, uh, these last two questions, and uh, we want to be respectful of your time. But before we do that, I just want to remind you, please fill out the blue um, survey in your packet. And also, if you didn't sign in on the way in, if you could please just do it on the way out. It's on the sign a sheet on that little table, we'd love to know who was here tonight. Okay, so, yes. Um, I have a question, sort of, I'm not sure who to direct it at, um, but it pertains to how you define this neural network when you're writing, when you're writing Q&As mm -hmm. and consumer information. So, 
Speaking of the contrast between Kaiser, the old way that managed care used to work, and now, um, one of the areas that I see the most confusion in questions I field and in friends and everything is this packaging idea. You know, the example has come up several times of the anesthesiologist. So it used to be, in the old days, you'd be thinking in network, out of network, and as I recall, you know, you'd, you'd go sort of by a facility and a medical group, and you'd pick a medical group, and you'd pick, you know, UC or whatever your hospital was, and you could pretty much assume that if you used a lab or an anesthesiologist, it was all sort of packaged together, right? And, you know, how, 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 how old days are you talking about? Well, <laughs> hang on, hang on. So, no, so I, I'm, I'm curious about how old, because, I mean, I delivered my daughter 15 years ago. Now, well, so. okay, I'm, I'm okay. not really sure, because, I, so I'd also write a lot for Kaiser and about Kaiser, and, and it is true that with Kaiser, all the pieces of the puzzle come together. And when someone is trying to pick a package of procedures, like they're getting something that done that is going to involve an oncologist and a lab and a um, chemo infusion center and a blah, blah, blah. I actually have had a hard time instructing people how they're supposed to go about finding out whether all these pieces are in network and how they're not going to get slammed. And so, yeah, you do end up giving the advice, well, the contrast is something like Kaiser where all the pieces are put together. And, and I'm wondering why this is so hard, why someone is constantly being hit by this jigsaw puzzle and, and why the networks are being defined in all these separate pieces like this. Because there's only one code? Or? Well, I, I, get, I get that, but like, let's say you're Aetna and you're doing your messaging or you're Blue Shield or Blue Cross. How did we get away from the, okay, I'm using X medical group and X facility, and therefore I can count on all those pieces being in place for me? I think, I mean, my personal opinion is that I think when you think of the 80s, um, there was a lot of people enrolled in managed care, and in managed care you did not have that issue with HMOs, when I say managed care, HMOs and capitated models. So within Cupboard, California, we have Western Health and Alliance, which is a, is a great HMO available to members in Northern California. You have Kaiser. Um, uh, Sharp, I believe, is an HMO. So there's some regional players. And that kind of issue doesn't exist in an HMO market. But on Cover California, you have a lot of PPO type uh, care. And I think that's where this this issue is most prevalent. Mm -hmm. And of course it's exacerbated by your having a lot of folks come on that don't have this experience mm -hmm. that a lot of us had with employer group coverage. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination okay. of things and I think it's really a function of the, the PPO type of insurance. I'm not saying it's okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm just saying that with that with having that we need to figure out and by we, I'm not saying Covered California, I'm saying you know, Covered California working with our contracted health plans, is there a way that we can be more clear as to um, what is covered? Because it certainly doesn't make sense, even with, with what we talked about, I was saying to Emily, so a hospital notifies a member, well, when they're there getting ready to have a procedure, are they just supposed to say, oh, never mind, let me leave and reschedule and reschedule my time off work and all of that? That just doesn't seem like it's reasonable either. I would agree with Anne that it, that it is partly a function of the uh, PPOs as opposed to HMOs. I mean, a, a PPO network is, I mean, the network is defined by the fact that each of those providers is contracting with the insurer. But there's not necessarily anything that ties those providers together to each other. Um, and that in combination with the fact that these networks are narrower than most people are accustomed to in, in employer plans. Okay. So, you know, if you had a broad pre PPO network, you got a pretty good chance of knowing that the, uh, all the various providers are going to be in network. Once the network narrows, the chances of, of one of them not, one or more of them not being in network. I see what you're saying. I guess I just feel like in terms of giving consumers how-to instructions to try to sell, tell somebody that they have to double check that their lab results are going to be sent to the right lab is asking somebody to do more than they, I mean, I mean 
it seems like once you sort of pick all your stuff, you should be able to count on the fact that the right lab's going to be used. And trying to advise someone how to investigate something as yeah, specific nice like that is really challenging. It's impossible. It's impossible. Yeah, it's really, yeah I, mean, I mean, as a journalist, what would you do? I wouldn't know what to do. And you don't have, and, and the consumer doesn't have the control as to where the doc, I mean, yeah. to sort of be right on that point where you're going to say to the doctor, oh, and doc, by the way, I can only use X lab. I mean, that's sort of an unrealistic expectation, so that it gets confusing in terms of what you're telling people. I have a quick question. Um, occasionally I hear from readers who say, well, I went to my doctor in June and they said they took cal covered California and now they're not. You know, and I'm like, I never got to the bottom of, can they just, what's happening there? Is, 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 is they think that they're in the net when they're not? Can, can they just quit? You know, and, and say I'm okay. <laughs> and shaking their no, head. No, I, I plans are required. If the, if the if the doctor needs plans are required to notify those members that are enrolled with that with those providers or seeing those providers to let them know that they're not in network anymore. So there's a requirement. There's going to be a regulatory. Well, so Sutter is a great example of where it's happening. Where Shield has sent a notification to all the members that are on Covered California, if you have this provider, that provider will no longer be available. Um, you can't continue seeing through June. I'm, I'm, we don't need to get into details, but that's an example of that notification occurring. So I don't know that it's not occurring. That could be, again, the providers being greedy. Okay. Well, that's sure. I that's <laughs> They're yeah, at the doctor's yeah, office and they're talking to someone behind the counter. This is how this is happening, and then they, they send me this note. They, they say, I just went to my doctor and I was told no, we're not longer taking this plan. And I've heard more. Have you heard that? It's, a, it's weird. I've Variations. heard that from a lot of people, yeah. and specifically with Sutter, that they yeah. they tell Sutter. people, oh, we don't take, we're not, you know, we don't accept covered California plans. We don't accept a, a whole slew of things. They don't accept CalPERS. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, see, and that's just simply not true because there are plans that do accept. No, but that's what providers. they're telling I know, you. I know. That's what they're telling you. I, I, I agree, and then you can look um, with this whole issue going on with Shield that Sutter is putting out information as well. But this is so non Blue Shield that we're not uh, all as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I, th I think there was some yeah. game. In Gamemanship early on okay. by some providers who smell right, you know. Um, but but it also may be the case that they have dropped that plan and then they sort of like can can do that. I think they could do that midstream though, like that. Just pull out the rug. Can they? They could terminate their agreement um, with the plan. It's subject to their contract requirements and you know how long they have to give notification okay. and all of that. But they they certainly have. I think the providers also generally would let their patients. You know, again, this is a regulatory issue. It's probably outside of, um, I'm just saying from my experience, having worked in a plan, that there were requirements for the plan to notify their members if a, a provider um, discontinued with it. Sometimes they're at bid negotiations and they think it's going to work, and then it mm -hmm. suddenly doesn't work. And so if it took a few months for the person to actually get a scheduled appointment, mm -hmm. then it can turn out three months ago they were taking those patients, and then when the negotiation fell through, they're not anymore. But this does get back to, I mean, there, there are, as complicated as the regulatory agencies are regulating health plans, um, there's not really a clear, you know, who's, who's going to police this against a provider who is maybe, you know, violating. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's really no one to do that. Great. So we've actually gone a few minutes over, um, but really fantastic discussion. I'd like to um, thank our panelists for providing us so much value here. Also, a big thank you again to the Chronicle uh, for allowing us to have this event here. Uh, thank you again to the, the Association of Healthcare Journalists for partnering with us in this event. And speaking of which, if there are reporters, editors, journalists here who are not members of AHCJ and uh, might be interested, um, they should speak with Colleen or Vicki or also Len Grazis in the back who is uh, here from the main office, uh, to, so you get to speak with anybody. There are lots of fantastic candidates at the HCJ, uh, including the upcoming conference, which is right here in um, Silicon Valley, coming up. Um, thank you again, and uh, we'll hopefully do it again soon.